start. Mm-hmm. Hey, good morning, guys. Let's all stand up. From the scriptures, how can I repay the Lord for all his goodness to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I'm going to try that again. Good morning, guys. Here we go. Back up there, Kayla, for me. How can I repay the Lord for all his goodness to me? I will lift up and call on the name of the Lord. I called to the Lord who is worthy of praise, and I have been saved from my enemies. The Lord lives, my great and my rock. Exalted be God, my Savior. Amen. Here we go. out there you can't see the tears in his eyes that I can see. <laughs> Gene, now upon your confession of faith that you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the living God, you're now being baptized in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. Now I belong to Jesus, Jesus belongs to me, not for the years of time alone, but for eternity. Amen. What 
a great way to start there. We're going to call that a, a wonderful beginning to 2024. As you can see, we're already up here, and I uh, hope you guys are too. The Lord is good. He has blessed us. And, uh, you know, what a wonderful way to start out our year by bringing his name to praise and worship. Speaking of end of the year, if you would be so led, please take a poinsettia home after service today. We, we need to clear all those out of here. So please uh, help yourselves to those there. All right, we will dance.
no sin that we might become his righteousness he humbled himself carried the cross of so amazing love so
Before doing so, I would like for each of us to reflect upon this outgoing year and ask ourselves how faithful we have been. Our Lord and Savior has been faithful to our Father and to us. God has always been faithful to his chosen people, <clears throat> keeping every promise he made. He is also faithful in his promise to us, sending Jesus to earth to be the perfect sacrifice for all of our sins. So this morning, ask yourself, have I done all Christ our Savior has asked me to do? I know I have fallen short over this year. Perhaps there are areas in your life where <clears throat> you find you also have fallen short. Many make resolutions to lose weight, give up vices, or become more physically fit. The list goes on and on. As we prepare to <clears throat> usher in the year 2024, I hope and pray each of us will make a resolution to be more faithful to our Redeemer. He did more for us than we can ever do for Him. He paid the ultimate price for our sins by allowing Himself to be placed and nailed to a cross to die an excruciating death and be buried. Praise God, this is not the end of the story. On the third day, he was raised from the dead and later ascended into heaven to take his place at the right hand of his Father. This morning, as we take the emblems, I will read Matthew 26, 26, and we will take the bread. Then I will read Matthew 26, verses 27 and 28, and we will take the cup. Matthew 26, 26. And while they were eating, Jesus took some bread, and after a blessing, he took, broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Matthew 26, 27, and 28. When he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sin. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing your Son to come be the perfect Lamb so that we can join you in heaven one day. I pray this in the Lord's holy and precious name. Amen. Amen.
have mercy on me, a sinner. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. As I walk through life, surviving pain and strife, every step leads closer to my death. But God shows me the way, the beauty of today. And I will praise my God with every breath. Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me. sins, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Here we go. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. 
but the blood of Jesus. Would you pray with me? Our precious Heavenly Father, what a glorious day it is. Your word tells us that the angels in heaven rejoice over one person who repents. And I know that they're throwing a party in heaven right now for Gene. And I just thank you for being able to be part of this service today and ask that you fill this place with your spirit now. Move among us. Touch our hearts and our lives. Encourage us. Strengthen us. Father, we have a whole new year ahead of us. And I just pray that it will be a glorious one as we serve you. And that you'll use us to continue to help this church grow in Paoli as we reach out to others with the love of Jesus. And now, O oh Lord, we just pray that you speak through your word to our hearts and to our lives today. And that you be glorified in everything we say and do. For it's in the precious blood, in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Whew. You almost had an opportunity. Oh, the kids are dismissed. Didn't have to do that for two weeks in a row. Back to business as usual. There we go. I've only got one clip-on tie in my whole closet, and, and this is it. And uh, about every two years, Bill pulls it on me and says, okay, it's bow tie Sunday. Um, I, I, you noticed last week, I did get Graham in a coat. But I'll know that I've really accomplished something when I get him in one of these. <laughs> it's just a wonderful Sunday to be here as we celebrate a new year coming. So many people love New Year's Eve because it offers a, a clean slate, a, a, a fresh start. You have a whole new year in front of you. And there are those here this morning that would like to see some changes in that year. Maybe you have some financial problems right now. Maybe your income is $3,000 and your outgo is $3,500. And it, it just seems like every month you get further and further behind. Maybe you learned this past week that in the new year that they're going to let your job go and you're going to have to find new employment this year. Maybe you and your spouse haven't getting, been getting along all that well and you're just praying that 2024 is going to bring that necessary change you've been waiting and wanting. For some people, maybe it means that you have a surgery upcoming that you're not looking forward to. Many teenagers feel stretched to the breaking point between their parents and the church pulling in one direction and their peers and their desires pulling in another. Whether it's the lonely, the sick, the dying, the bankrupt, the exhausted, we're all looking forward to 2024 for a change. Now some of the changes are, are, are less than others. Maybe you're like me and and you know you need to lose some weight in the coming year. Maybe your income covers your basics, but, but you know you're just one big financial problem away from losing it all. Maybe it's an unalert spouse, a boring job, poor grades, lack of really friends you can trust in, and, and the list can go on and on and on. For while many appear to be confident on the outside, most of us on the inside at times feel empty and unsure. And we're hoping maybe 2024 will change all that. Well, I've got great news for you this morning. <laughs> but it's not that 2024 offers change. It's that Jesus Christ is available. And he's the one that can bring the changes you really need in your life. It was Jesus who said in Matthew 11, verse 28, Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. And so, on, on this New Year's Eve, I, if you have your Bible, turn to, to John chapter 5 with me this morning. And, and I want you to look with me at a story of a man who, after 38 years of desperate need, had his life changed by Jesus in an instant. And I want you to see how Jesus motivated this man to be a candidate for healing uh, because I believe that there are some prerequisites in this that still remain for us today. The first thing I want you to see is that Jesus encouraged this guy to be specific about his desires. What do you want? 
In verse 6 of John 5, it says, When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he'd been in that condition for a long time, he asked him, Do you want to get well? (laughs) Now, on that surface, that seems like a pretty strange question, doesn't it? Uh, I mean, if you read a little deeper, you find out this guy had been there for 38 years. When a guy has been sick and lame for 38 years, Asking him if you want to get well is like asking somebody who's starving, do you want something to eat? But the truth is, some sick people don't want to get well. Dave Revere, who was wounded while serving in Vietnam, tells the story of a a young man who received his draft notice in the late 1960s. And so, (coughs) before he went in for his physical, he went and had all of his teeth pulled out because he thought that would make him exempt from military duty. Well, he went for his physical, and sure enough, he found, was found unfit because he had flat feet. <clears throat> you know, there are some people who, who, if they have a chance to be healed, would rather be infirmed. Now, that may not be the case with most of us today, but... But some physically sick people deep down inside don't want the responsibility that comes with good health. Instead, they'd rather get the sympathy from others. They'd rather complain and maybe manipulate people through their sickness. or, Or some think that their illness is a punishment for what they've done in the past. And they feel like they just don't deserve to get well. So Jesus goes straight to this man who after 38 years is laying by this pool and Jesus says, do you want to get well? And as we think about changes that we'd like to see take place in 2004, I think that's a question that we need to answer too. Because the first step to making real change in your life is to want to change. Maybe this morning you're struggling in your marriage. Do you really want to get well? I mean, I've had people come to my office and tell me that what they were going through and, and the, the things they were struggling with. And, and when it came right down to the end and I asked that question, do you want to get well? Uh, they'll sit there for a few minutes. And then maybe one, maybe both, they'll say, I'm not sure. I, I, I don't really know if I want this to work out. You see, they've been hurt. There's a loss of trust. They lack desire to really put things back together. They don't know if they want to restore the relationship. Some of you are in 2024 with emotional stress. Scars in your life. and The question is, do you really want to get well? I came across a story about a mom whose daughter got married and she, she, she really became an emotional wreck because, because she was her only daughter and now she's married and, and she wasn't calling as often as she thought that she should and she didn't come over like she thought she would and, and she began to think that her daughter really didn't care. And so this mother began to wallow in self-pity and wring her hands and tell everybody who would listen about her daughter and how she was treating her and And her daughter heard what her mom was saying, and that made her less apt to act to come over. So the mother spends her days wallowing. Psychologists say there's a a primary and a secondary gain that people imagine from their irresponsible irresponsible behavior. In this case, the primary gain, gain was the mother was getting the attention of people who felt sorry for her. And she got to the point where she believed that if she doesn't act like that, then people aren't going to have sympathy anymore. Meanwhile, the secondary gain is she was imagining that she was making her daughter feel guilty, and maybe if she felt bad, she'd come back home again. But the truth of the matter is, her sickness was self-perpetuating. Those people, including her daughter, were turned off by her whining and really didn't want to be around her anymore. And, And... Her daughter, well, she'd be more likely to come and visit if she felt relaxed and loved at home, not always put down. 
But the truth is, the mother doesn't really want to get well. She likes the position she's in. She feels like she has power. And some of you here today are spiritually handicapped by addiction. I love the story of Zig Ziglar. He said he was walking through a store one day when he walked past a mirror, you know, one of those full-length mirrors. And he said, and I realized for the first time, I'm addicted to food. <laughs> he said, I turned and I looked in the mirror and I said, man, you need to lose like 80 pounds today. So he took a picture of a person he would like to be, the kind of thin and muscular, and, and he put it on his fridge to give him something to shoot for. He said, I'm one of those guys that gets more out of positive motivation. You know what I mean? He said, I know you can get those things that you open the door of the fridge and they oink at you or call you fat so or laugh at you. But he said, that stuff doesn't work with me. He said, I put my goal right there in front of me. Maybe you're like me. Maybe you have a tendency to overeat. And every year you make a resolution. But after a few days, you give up and you say, well, I can't stop. I like food too much. The real question is, do you want to get well? Or maybe there's some today who are addicted to, to drugs or alcohol or pornography and you know deep inside it's destroying your life, it's hurting your family. Do, do you want to get well? No, really, do you want to get well? Minrith and Meyer wrote a book on overcoming depression entitled Happiness is a Choice. And here's what they wrote. Listen. As psychiatrists, we cringe whenever Christian patients use the word can't. Because every good psychiatrist knows that words like can't and I've tried are merely lame excuses. Instead, we insist our patients be honest with themselves and use language that expresses the real situation. We tell our patients, don't use can't, use I won't. I just won't get along with my mate. My spouse and I won't communicate. I won't discipline my kids the way I should. I, I just won't give up that affair I'm involved in. I won't stop overeating. I won't find time to pray. For you see, well, sick people prefer the word can't. Paul tells us in God's word in Philippians chapter 4, verse 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We need to determine what our desire really is. As you go into this next year and you make your resolutions or you make your decisions of what you want your, to be, really ask yourself, do I really want to get well? Or is just, this just another lame effort at something I'm not really going to try? The second prerequisite for healing was to quit blaming others for his problems. In verse 7, after Jesus said, do you want to get well? It says, sir, the man replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. And while I'm trying to get in, someone else always goes down ahead of me. Now, there were people who believed that this pool had miraculous powers. It's kind of like people who many years ago would go to French Lake or West Baden for, for mineral baths because they thought they would make them healthier. And periodically, the, the, the pool water in Bethesda would bubble up. Some have found later that there's an underground spring underneath it that over time builds up pressure and then pushes upward, and, and that causes the water to churn. But, but, but there was this tradition that said that periodically an angel was coming down and stirring that water. And, and when that angel came down and stirred the water, the first one in the water would be healed. So, of course, the porches were covered with sick people and the afflicted people who saw this as maybe a way to get well. So, when Jesus first asked this guy, do you want to get well? His excuse was to blame everybody else. And every time the water stirred, there's no one to help me in the pool. 
And it seems like, you know, the healthier ones, they always get there first. And, and nobody cares about the poor cripple like me. Isn't it a shame that those who need the most get the least help? And it's been 38 years now. Nobody's helped me yet. It's so easy to blame others for what ails us. That's been our scapegoat since the beginning of time. You know that, don't you? In Genesis chapter 3, when God says to Adam, did you eat the fruit I told you not to eat? Adam's answer is, the woman you gave me, she gave me the fruit and I, and I ate it. God, it, it's not my fault, it's her fault. And by the way, you're the one who put her here. Moses said, Aaron, what possessed you to make a golden calf for these people to worship? Aaron's answer was, well, Moses, you were away a long time. And, and the people wanted a God that they could see. And, and I, I just took the gold jewelry they gave me and I threw it in the fire and out came this calf. It's not my fault, Moses. You're the one that was gone too long. It's not my fault, it's the people's fault. They asked for it, and the gold cost it, and the fire cost it. It's not my fault. Let's jump over to the New Testament. Pilate's asked, what are you going to do with Jesus? And the Bible says that he brought out a bowl of water, and he washed his hands in front of them all. And he says, do with him as you please. But remember, it's not my fault. I'm washing my hands of it. And we do the same thing. I quit drinking if she quit nagging all the time. Well, I quit nagging if he wouldn't come home drunk every night. I, I go to church, but the people are so cold. I'd work harder, but people don't appreciate what I do now. I should have gotten the promotion, but the boss just doesn't like me. And one of the things God wants to know is, are you willing to accept responsibility for your actions? There's an old story of how King William Frederick of Potsdam visited an English prison. And while he was visiting there, every prison prisoner he came across claimed to be framed. Nobody was guilty and they all deserved a pardon. Until he said finally he ran into one man, one man the whole day who came up to him and said, I'm guilty. I'm getting what I deserve. I'm paying for what I did. But please have grace. The story goes, upon hearing this, King Frederick turned to his aide and said, we need to pardon this guy immediately and get him out of here before he corrupts all these innocent people. We often have a difficult time saying, I'm responsible. It was my fault. Instead, we blame it on hereditary, heredity or environment, educational difficulties. Everything but ourselves. Somebody else's fault. But the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 14, verse 12, one day, each of us will give an account of himself before God. Listen, one day you're going to stand in front of God and you're not going to be able to blame it on anybody else. Thirdly, we need to make an effort to stretch beyond ourselves. John 5 verse 8 says, Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat, and walk. Now, did you ever notice as you read through the gospel that frequently Jesus would ask people to do something in order to show their faith. The, the, there, were, there were 10 lepers who came to Jesus one time. Do you remember the story? And, and they wanted to be healed. And Jesus said, go and show yourself to the priest, which was what you were supposed to do after you were healed. And it says, and as they were on their way, they were healed. But only one, only a Samaritan came back to thank Jesus, remember? But, but Jesus asked them to make an effort. Jesus took some mud once and put him on the eyes of a man that was born blind. Do you remember? And he said, 
go and wash that off in the pool of Siloam. And what he did, he could see. And in John 5, he told a man who hadn't walked in 38 years, get up, pick up your mat, and walk. Now, to some extent, uh, I think this is a test of this guy's resolve. Jesus was evaluating the man's willingness to make an effort to help himself. Jesus wants us to change us from the inside out. But listen, it takes some effort on our part too. In John 5 verse 9 it says that once the man was cured and he picked up his man and he walked. But in order to be healed, the man had to make an effort. Let, let me ask you this morning, do you really want things to change in 2024? Because it may mean that you need to stretch beyond yourself. It may mean that you need to put yourself out there. He probably had people tell him for years, doctor after doctor, about cures or treatments or, or places that he could go to get help. But when Jesus told him to get up and pick up his mat and walk, he did it. And when he did it, he was healed. And so I ask you, do you want to get well? Maybe a better question was, how badly do you want it? Listen, you can come to church every Sunday in 2024, and you can be a pew potato, and you can sit there and not get involved, and not grow in your walk with Jesus Christ, not grow in your relationship with God and other Christians. Oh, you're here, but are you really here? It's up to you. Do you want to get well enough to put in the effort? That's a big question. And then he wanted to get well enough to obey Jesus. Now it may amaze you to know that this guy had never seen Jesus before. The first time he ever met Jesus but there was something distinctive about Jesus that caught his attention. He wasn't like the other people who come around and acted like they wanted to help but didn't. When Jesus spoke, there was power in his words and in his commands. And the man responded in faith. And once he had been cured, he continued to obey. Verses 9 through 11 says, Now the day that this took place was the Sabbath. <clears throat> so the Jews said to the man who had been healed, it's the Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat. But he replied, I love this, the man who made me well said, pick up your mat and walk. And so he did. For if you want to get well, you've got to acknowledge a unique authority in Jesus Christ to change your life. You can get all kinds of counsel from people in the world who will tell you how to straighten things out. They'll tell you things like, well, just go with the flow. Have another drink. Don't be so uptight. Try this new drug. It's just free for the taking. But there's just one who has the ultimate authority and who can change your life forever. Matthew 28, 18 says, Jesus said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to who? To me. And John writes in 1 John 3, verses 21 and 22, Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from him anything we ask. Because, because what? We obey his command and do what pleases him. I used to love the story that Norman Vincent Peale used to tell uh, of how he was out behind his dad's barn one day smoking a cigar. You know how kids will be. And he said, as I was out there, he said, I heard a noise and I realized that my dad was coming around the corner of the barn and there was nothing to do. So I took the cigar and I put it in my coat pocket. He said, my dad came up and he said, Norman, I just wanted to tell you that I'm going into town this afternoon. And Norman loved to go to town. He said, Dad, can I come along? He said, I'll never forget what my dad said. 
He said, Norman, never ask a special favor when you're harboring a smoldering disobedience. John tells us we have confidence before God and receive anything we ask because we obey his commandments. And we do what honors him. But I want you to see last but not least that he gave all the credit to Jesus. Now, at first Jesus slipped away into the crowd. Have you ever noticed that as you go through the Gospels, usually when Jesus healed somebody, he didn't make a big production out of it? A lot of times he'd even tell people, now don't tell anybody about this. God doesn't need a circus to heal you. In fact, when he chooses to heal, he often does it without fanfare. But Jesus came back and revealed himself to this man <coughs> because he wanted to give him not just a healthy body, but a healthy spirit. And so in John chapter 5, verse 14, it says, Later Jesus found him in the temple and said, See, you're well again. Stop sinning. Or something worse may happen to you. Now, what could be worse than being lame for 38 years? Being separated from God for all eternity. That's what's worse. And Jesus came back to put this man on the right track. Verse 15 said, And the man went away and told the Jews it was Jesus who had made him well. Now when God works in your life, you be sure to give God the credit and the thanks. The problem is that we go thing, through things in our lives and sometimes, sometimes when everything is going good, we take the credit for ourselves, don't we? Well, well, you know, I worked hard, and, and, and I got a good education, and, and sure, there was some luck, but, but, but I put a lot of effort in. When you should be saying, you know, I couldn't do this without God. He, he's the one who gave me the talents. He's the one who gave me the abilities. He's the one who gave me the job. It's all about him. I, I love this one. Hope you will too. It, it, it's a story, maybe you've heard it before. The woodpecker. There's this woodpecker was pecking on a tree in the middle of a storm when all of a sudden a bolt of lightning came out of the car, sky and split that tree right down the middle. And, and, and that bird just flew off in a flash. But, but, but Ten minutes later, he was back with eight of his friends, and he pointed at the tree and said, there she is, boy, split right down the middle. <sighs> There's a real temptation when God does something wonderful in our life. If we're not careful to take the credit for ourselves. But remember the words of Paul, who said, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Jesus has the ability to turn our lives around in 2024 if we will just put our trust in him. Do, do you remember in John 9, there's a story of, uh, of a woman who was caught in the very act of adultery? I mean, caught at it. And, and they brought her to Jesus and they threw her down on the ground and they said, all right, Jesus, the law says you stone a woman like that to death. But what do you say? And the Bible says that Jesus got down, I think he was kind of ignoring him, and began to write in the dirt. After a few minutes, they said, well, Jesus, what do you say? And the Bible says he looked up and he said, let the one who's never sinned Cast the first stone. And I love what the Bible said. It says, and one by one, starting with the oldest, they dropped their stones and went away. 
And then Jesus looked up, and the only one there was the woman. And he said, didn't any of them condemn you? She said, nobody. He said, neither do I. Now go and sin no more. He didn't say what she did was all right. He said, you need to change your life. Now go and sin no more. And you know what? There are a lot of us here this morning who need a change of life in 2024. Who need to admit to ourselves, you know what? I've done some things that aren't right. But you know what? Through Jesus Christ, God forgives you. But now he wants you to go out and he wants you to have a whole new life. Go and sin Hi, I'm Gary Swick, and I'd like to thank you for listening to the message this morning at Paoli Christian Church. We hope that what you've heard has touched your heart and encouraged you in your walk with God. We would really like to hear from you if you have any spiritual needs that we might help you with. You can contact us by looking for us online at paolichristianchurch.org or by phone at 812-723-2664. Paoli Christian Church is located at 1700 West Hospital Road in Paoli, Indiana. Once more, thank you for listening, and I hope that you'll listen again next Sunday as we worship God together at Paoli Christian Church.